Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is very devastating. The details are very difficult to hear, but before we do get into those details, let's talk about something positive that could never fail to make you smile, your dog. I know all of you care so much about your little fur baby as much as I care about mine, and that includes wanting to feed her the best possible quality food that I can. And that is why I love Sundays. Sundays is a dog food company founded by a vegetarian that offers fresh, air-dried, human-grade food that is easy to store and serve. They are on a mission to make feeding your dogs premium nutrition as simple as possible. Sundays offers human-grade food from start to finish. You will only find real food ingredients that you can not only recognize and pronounce, but you could eat it yourself. Each recipe starts off with whole protein, whether it be all-natural turkey, chicken, or USDA-grade beef. That is followed by protein from mineral-rich organs and ground bones. 10% of the rest of the recipe is made up of superfoods that benefit dogs' overall wellness. They come in ready-to-serve meals, eliminating the need for refrigeration, preparation, defrosting, or concerns about contaminants. It's shelf-stable, ready-to-travel, and again, full of nutrients. It's easy and healthy, which is very difficult to find in pre-made dog food. Sunday's dog food is air-dried, which gives it a soft, jerky-like texture, which my dog is obsessed with while preserving its nutrition and flavor, unlike kibble, which loses many of its vitamins and minerals due to high temperature cooking. My dog, I, I love her to death, but she has cost me so much money with vet visits because she has a very, very, very sensitive tummy. She gets sick with so many normal dog foods because they just aren't suitable for maintaining her health. She is also a very picky eater. She only eats her breakfast and dinner about half of the time, so half the time she's not even eating anything. She is such a little princess. She's so picky. She's so funny. But she is obsessed with Sundays. She loves the freeze-dried texture, so I know that she's eating all her meals as she should and getting all the nutrients that she needs. And she hasn't had any episodes of tummy troubles since starting her new diet. My dog Willow actually has so much more energy since starting her new diet because she is eating everything that she should. So she's been a crazy little girl lately. And usually while I'm recording, she will try to jump up with me. And that's what she's doing now. She, <laughs> she was just sitting next to my side and wagging her tail, which means that she wants something, which means that she wants attention probably. But either way, starting a new diet can be a big change, so that is why Sundays offers samples. Give your pup the chance to try Sundays and watch them fall in love. Just pay shipping and handling for the samples. Then, when you're ready to order, you can get 35% off of your first order when you follow the link down below at sundaysfordogs.com slash Rachel Shannon and use code Rachel Shannon. You and your dog are going to be obsessed. Trust us. She is too. Thank you again so much to Sundays for partnering with me on today's video. Say goodbye to Willow. She can go on the floor now because she is very distracting. Okay, you go, baby. She likes to lay under my bed, and if you hear that little sound that she just made, that's her shaking off because she shakes off my pets sometimes. And that is her drinking. <laughs> so now on a different note, completely different note, like I said, today's video is very disturbing, to say the least. This is one of the worst cases of abuse that I think I have looked into, and researching this case was very tough. I actually researched it a while ago, maybe three or four weeks ago at this point, but I couldn't bring myself to share this case until now, because whatever you can imagine a child could go through for absolutely no reason, this is going to be worse. So, if that is something that you are very sensitive to, I would advise that you skip this video for now. But if you can handle it, I want you to hear the story of this sweet, adorable little boy who was taken from this world way too soon for absolutely no reason. So, without any further delay, 
let's get into it. Judah Morgan was born on June 17th, 2017 in Laporte, Indiana to 21-year-old Mary Yoder and 23-year-old Alan Morgan. When Judah was born, he had one older brother who was three years old at the time. Judah was known to be a happy, energetic little boy. He loved fruit and popcorn on family movie nights. He was also known to be an intelligent little boy who learned very quickly and loved teaching others about the things that he knew. His family says that only 18 months old, Judah knew his right hand from his left. He loved wearing hats and smiling big for photos. He loved spending time with his siblings and playing with the family dogs, Thor and Willow, taking them to the park with his family whenever he got a chance. He loved jumping into puddles, riding his bike, and being outdoors. He loved to sing and dance, and some of his favorite shows were Paw Patrol, PJ Masks, and The Magic School Bus. He loved the movie Cars, with his favorite character being Lightning McQueen. However, Judah had a very rough life from the moment he was born. In the days before he was born, the Department of Child Services had received complaints that Judah's older siblings had been abused and neglected by their parents, and upon investigation, it appeared that there was abuse and neglect happening in the home. And when he was born, it was found that Judah had very large amounts of THC in his system, so his mother couldn't bring herself to stop smoking weed while she was pregnant. So, Judah's three-year-old brother was removed from the home, and he was placed with his maternal grandmother. Judah was then not allowed to return home with his family and was placed into kinship care. Judah was placed into the care of his biologically related third cousin, Gina Hollett, and her husband, Phil. Gina had three children of her own, Kyle, Caitlin, and Madison, and she thought that Judah would adjust really well in her home. She knew that she could provide a stable, safe, loving home for Judah to grow up in. Now, there is a difference between being placed into foster care and kinship. Foster parents have to have a license that requires specific requirements in order to have a child placed into their care. They're given payments by the government to help take care of that child as well. They have the option to adopt at a certain point, but the goal with foster care is to eventually place the child back with their biological family. As we know, foster care doesn't always work, and although the goal is that there is a very strict criteria and there are a lot of regulations that have to be followed, there are a lot of situations where children end up in homes that are bad, if not worse, from the home that they were taken from, but in a lot of situations, the foster family is amazing. They do their best to care for the child and make them feel welcome and like they're a part of the family. On the other hand, kinship care is legal guardianship by relatives or very close friends of the family. A lot of times, kinships involve grandparents, siblings of the parents, so the child's aunts or uncles. A lot of the times, this can be done with or without the involvement of a child welfare agency. They also aren't given any sort of financial assistance for taking a child in. A lot of times, kinship is the preferred choice because they get to stay with their biological or close family. They get to stay in a situation that they may be more familiar with. They may get to keep contact with their siblings if, let's say, only one child is removed from the home. Either way, while Judah was with Gina and her family, they considered him as one of their own. Judah's older siblings all loved and adored their baby brother. Judah called Gina mommy and Phil daddy. He went on to meet all of his motor milestones right on schedule, some of them being early. Like I said, he was an intelligent young boy, and he was potty trained by the age of two years old. He lived with the Hullets for the next four years of his life, so basically, that was all he knew. Gina and Phil wanted to adopt Judah as his own, and over those four years, they were told several times that they would be given the chance to. They were promised that eventually, Judah would be theirs permanently. While Judah was living with Gina and Phil, Mary Yoder, his biological mother, went on to have two more children. One in October of 2019 and in September of 2020. Both, I believe, were sons. Also, during the course of those four years, Judah had to do home visits with his biological parents. But throughout these visits, Gina and Phil saw just how much Judah hated going to these visits. 
He would cry and ask not to go, and every time Gina would have to look away and hide how upset she was, knowing that she had no choice but to send him to his biological parents' house. As these visits went on, Judah started telling Gina and Phil about the abuse that he was witnessing in their home. He said that he saw Alan kick his younger brother down the stairs and said that Alan was hurting him as well. Then for some ungodly reason, still haven't been able to figure it out, Alan and Mary were granted overnight visits and even though Judah was potty trained, he started having accidents in the middle of the night after these overnight visits started happening. Children who are potty trained having sudden bouts of accidents in bed can be a huge sign that something is going on, whether it be abuse or psychological trauma. It is an indicator that something is going on. Now, while doing these home visits, it was clear that neither Judah's older brother or he should be placed back with his biological family. I think it's also clear that the other siblings should have been removed from the home as well. But according to Gina, the LaPorte County DCS simply dropped the ball. The county's regional manager told Gina that they were going to be filing a termination on parental rights two different times. One was in 2019 and the other was in 2020, but this was never done. And Gina says that she never got an explanation for why. I've spent a lot of time with this case trying to figure out exactly why, how the courts determined that the home in which Alan and Mary lived was suitable for children, why they went forward with home visits and overnight visits and a trial home visit when it was clear that Mary and Alan put no effort forward whatsoever to create a good environment for their children. Even on social media, Mary was posting Facebook posts to say that Alan didn't love her, respect her, or treat her right. There were clearly issues in the family and they weren't even hiding them. There were obvious issues in the relationship that were blatantly obvious for anybody who knew the couple. But somehow, the courts decided to place these children back with Mary and Alan. By October of 2020, Judah's older brother, who again had been living with his grandparents, was placed back with his biological family. Then in April of 2021, Judah was placed back in the care of Mary and Alan. When the decision was made, Gina and Phil were devastated. They tried to warn the courts of all of the red flags that they clearly saw saying that this was not a safe situation for Judah, but they didn't care. Judah was back with Mary and Alan, and after returning home, Mary would not allow Gina to see Judah ever again. As you can expect, this placement did not end well at all. Only a few months after his placement at 2.45 a.m. on November 11, 2021, the LaPorte County Police Department received a 911 call from Mary Yoder to report that their four-year-old son was unconscious and not breathing. After the officers were dispatched, they were informed that the child had been battered by his father, Alan Morgan. They had received a second call at 2.53 a.m. saying that Alan had lost his temper and hurt the child. She said that she was scared and she didn't know what to do. Officer Michael Sweet was the first officer to arrive on scene by 2.58 a.m. with other deputies arriving a minute or two later. They initially knocked on the doors and nobody answered. So they made their way in through the unlocked door. Immediately upon entering, police found a four-year-old male lying inside of a bedroom. He was nude, covered in a blanket, and he had bruises all over his little body, as well as bruises and other red marks on his face, neck, and head. He was also clearly malnourished, and when they checked him for a pulse, he didn't have one. He also noted that the boy was cold to touch, so he had been deceased for quite some time. Officers then went around the home to check and see if there was anyone else there, and they found three additional children, aged seven to and one year old. They were alive, so they were taken out of the home and escorted to ambulances for treatment. At that time, they were unable to locate any adults within the home, so all of these young children had just been left alone in the home. It was also clear to law enforcement that both Mary and Alan had been on the run, so they put out a bolo or a be on the lookout for Alan and Mary 
as well as their vehicles. When they started looking around the home, they saw that the entire inside of the home was absolutely filthy. The outside of the home had trash everywhere, and on the inside of the home, they found clothes everywhere, garbage strewn all around, rotting food, and animal feces all throughout the home. There was also a very strong odor of urine and rotting food. When officers entered the kitchen, they saw that the fridge had a lock on it, which prevented anybody from getting inside of it. There were two cats walking around the house, as well as a dog that was locked inside of a tiny cage, and it was extremely malnourished, according to court documents. The crate was filled with feces and urine, and the dog's hair was completely matted and dirty, the dog's crate was located near the kitchen, located at the top of the basement stairs. Which, again, just very disturbing. Animal abuse is just, it's just as worse as child abuse. And <laughs> it's, it's awful. This case is awful. But let's keep going. We haven't even gotten into the worst part of this case yet. As investigators made their way into the unfinished basement, they found that it was cold and dark and none of the lights worked. They found that there were several pieces of silver and camouflage duct tape all around the floor in that basement. They found one piece of duct tape taped together to a small circle shape, only a few inches in diameter, so like a ring shape. They found another small piece of duct tape stuck to a small black sock. Then there was another piece of duct tape stuck to the wall. The duct tape was located about one foot off of the floor and was sticking to a two by four piece of wood or a stud used for framing a wall. They also found a small training infant sized toilet containing feces and urine. They found a large fluffy blanket in the basement that also had pieces of duct tape stuck to it and the blanket also smelled like urine. They found small toddler-sized sweatpants, which also smelled like urine. There were also two small pipes and a coaxial cable in the basement near where the blanket, sweatpants, tape, and toilet were all located. As these investigators were looking throughout the house and were finding this horrific scene, other officers were able to locate both Alan and Mary, who were in Knox, Indiana. By 7 a.m. that morning, they were taken into custody and questioned. Now, Mary was interviewed by detectives and she told them a very disturbing story. It really shed a light on everything that was going on in the house and all of the horrific, awful things that those poor children and pets had been through. Mary said that Alan was very abusive towards all of the children, but especially Judah. So I'm going to tell you some of the things that were going on in the house, but again, they are awful, they're horrific. So, Mary said that Alan would send Judah to the basement as punishment for not being potty trained like the other children were. Which, as we stated earlier, Gina said that he was potty trained. So, that doesn't seem to be the reason why he was punished. So, they're either lying or he was having accidents because he was being abused and he was traumatized. Mary said that Alan would bind Judah by using duct tape. He shut off the lights in the basement on purpose so that he could scare him and would purposely withhold food as punishment. Mary said that she would also send Judah down to the basement for punishment while Alan was at work. According to Mary, he would be in the basement about three times per week, but she couldn't say how long he would be trapped down there. She did say, though, that there were times that he would be trapped down there for a period of a few days at a time before he would be allowed to come back up and join the rest of the family. She also said that she would typically send Judah down to the basement naked, so they wanted him as cold and vulnerable as possible. Once he was out of the basement, Mary would say that if Alan told him to go back down, if Judah refused, Alan would grab him by the neck and would forcibly carry him down there. She said that there wasn't a bed down there, but she said that there was a fuzzy blanket to make sure that he was nice and comfy. She said that she saw Alan physically abuse and beat Judah, and there were times that Mary would try to stop him and apparently say, that's enough, or leave him alone. She also denied having ever physically abused Judah, but she admitted that she didn't do much of anything to stop Alan from abusing him. 
She said that she would leave him in the basement for days at a time and did nothing to comfort him, make Alan stop hurting him, or even, I don't know, maybe let him go back to his foster family since they clearly did not want him in their house. They clearly hated him, but Gina was not allowed to see him anymore because she was going to treat him right and they couldn't have that happen for whatever reason. Then police went ahead and interviewed Judah's older brother, who was seven years old at the time. Judah's older brother said that he witnessed Mary forcibly take Judah down to the basement multiple times. He said that he has seen Mary do this alone, Alan would do it alone, and there were times that they would bring him down there together. He said that he heard Alan and Mary screaming at each other and at Judah while they were in the basement, and he also heard sounds of physical abuse while he was in the basement as well. He said that he witnessed Alan beating Judah with his hands. He said that he's seen Judah be bound at the wrists and ankles with duct tape. He said that Judah's arms would typically be forced behind his back. The brother said that he had just had his birthday party that past Sunday on November 10th, and he said that while the party was going on, Judah was in the basement. That's where he almost always was when he was living with Mary and Alan. He spent all of those months living with his biological parents, being bound and beaten inside of a cold, dark basement without food, without a bathroom, and without clothes. Police then went ahead and spoke with Jesse Morgan, who is Alan's brother. He told detectives that at 2.23 a.m. on November 11th, so about 22 minutes before 911 received that call, he started getting messages from Mary saying that she needed help because there was a serious emergency happening. At 2.25 a.m., Mary tried calling Jesse through Facebook Messenger, but he didn't answer. So, Mary sent Jesse another message, which stated, quote, I mean, I kind of hate him right now. I mean, I have every right to, I guess, but I still don't want him to kill himself. You know, I don't need two people gone in one day. Jesse also told the police that he had been over at their house for their birthday party on the 10th, and he said that he hadn't seen Judah. He was told by Mary and Alan that Judah was over at his friend's house that day. So, we have a pretty clear picture of what happened that day. Alan and Mary had been abusing Judah as well as their other children, but it seemed like Judah got the worst of it. So, after finding his tiny, lifeless body on November 11th, Judah was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. And as if this case couldn't get any worse, what that boy went through in his final moments are horrific. Judah died as a result of blunt force trauma to his head, causing a massive subdural hematoma, basically a brain bleed as a result of trauma to the head. After finding all of this out, of course, Alan was arrested and charged with counts of first-degree murder, five counts of neglect, and one count of cruelty to an animal. As police continued their investigation to build a case against Alan, they found that there was actually surveillance video from inside the home that showed Alan repeatedly punching Judah, holding him up by his neck and dropping him on the floor. And it showed him leaving Judah alone for hours and hours and hours at a time in that cold, dark basement. The video showed that on October 7th, 2021, Alan punched Judah at least 13 times that day and another 15 times the following day. They also saw him kicking and throwing Judah as well. The surveillance camera then showed Alan carrying the lifeless body from the basement. They then found internet searches on his computer for how to perform CPR on a toddler. I don't know the exact day that this happened because again, they called 911 in November, but all of these incidents are described as happening in October, so I'm not sure how long he had been dead before his body was found, but just based on what I've deduced from this case, I do think that the CPR and the Google searches were probably on November 10th or 11th, and these other incidences happened in October. Either way, like we said earlier, Mary claimed that she never physically harmed Judah, but the surveillance video showed that on October 6th, she was seen striking him and throwing him to the floor before repeatedly kicking him. The days after that show the family leaving the house with Judah, leaving him in the basement alone again for hours and hours and hours at a time. So, as of September of 2022, Alan has pled guilty to charges of murder and battery, and in exchange for his guilty plea, 
the charges of neglect and animal cruelty have been dropped, which I think is ridiculous. It's like the abuse and neglect of those other children that suffered didn't really matter to them. And that poor dog, its life doesn't matter to the courts either. In exchange for the plea, the prosecution took life without parole off the table. Instead, Allen was given a sentence of 70 years in prison before he will be considered for parole. The judge in this case said that the level of abuse and physical harm that this child went through was enough to say that he deserves the longest possible sentence. Which I guess I'm thankful for that Allen isn't going to get off easy for what he did, but I certainly hope that he never gets out of prison because this case is just ridiculous. As for Mary, her trial and charges took a lot longer. She initially pled not guilty and was set to go on trial in September of this year. However, as of a couple of weeks ago, she just had her most recent court appearance in which she accepted responsibility for neglecting Judah. She has just pleaded guilty to charges of a felony count of neglect that resulted in death, as well as domestic battery for incidents involving the other children. The judge in this case took the plea under consideration and has set a hearing for November 1st to decide whether to accept the plea and to carry out the sentencing. So, of course, I will let you all know what comes of that. Now, after all of this was found out, obviously those in Judah's life wanted to know how this could have possibly happened. It turned out that DCF never once checked on Judah after placing him in the home with his biological parents. Not only that, but they had actually closed his case two months after being placed. So this is a clear case of pure laziness causing the worst possible outcome for a child. Just everything's a constant reminder. Dandelions. He would pick, squat down and pick up the, the little flower, the dandelion. Judah is not Gina Hollett's biological son, but from the start, he was always her baby boy. He called me mommy, called my husband daddy, my kids were his siblings. At four years old, he was already a comedian. Jeez. He liked to dance, he loved to dance. Baby. That's you. Baby. It's very, very sweet and loving up until he would have visits and then he would come home angry. Hullet says she tried multiple times to alert DCS to the potential abuse, but that they never acted on her claims. I'm screaming for help and nobody's listening. But Hullet at least knew he would be safe once he got in her arms. Judah seemed to know that too. Oh, every time he'd come home from a visit, he'd tell me, take off your shoes, mommy. He knew if my shoes were off, we weren't going anywhere. He wasn't going to visit, we, we were staying at home. He would scream and they would have to pry him off of me because he did not want to go to visit. In April of 2021, Jenna says a judge mandated that Judah be sent back to live with his biological parents for a trial home visit. Any further access to Judah would depend on his biological parents, her cousin Alan Morgan and his wife Mary Yoder, who denied the Hullets access. And then it went from three days a week to just completely ripped them from us, put them with them, and we weren't allowed to visit them. We, so in my eyes, he was probably scared. Um, didn't understand why we dropped him off there and never came back. I was mourning him then, but I always had hope that we would see him again. I even told my husband, I'm going to start writing him a letter so when he gets older, he doesn't, I want him to know that we always loved him. I'm tired of hearing about the system failing children and, and babies and nobody should have to bury their child. And although I didn't give birth to him, he, he was my baby. Long story short, they dropped the ball. I mean, they told me on super, two separate occasions, the Lopeport County, um, Regional manager had told me that they were to file uh, um, termination of parental rights on two different occasions, and for some unknown reason, they failed to do so, and all he could do was apologize, and he said they just had to start the case over. If the people responsible for protecting this child had done their job, then maybe this adorable little child would be alive today. If those workers had just filed for the parental rights to be terminated, if they had checked on him even one time, even one time, time after he was placed with them, they would have seen how badly they were all being treated. All they had to do was literally knock on the door of Mary and Alan's house, let them open and look past them to see how badly this house was and how badly the conditions that these children were living in. 
and they didn't even do that. The people in this case didn't even have to go above and beyond. They didn't have to go beyond the expectations. They literally just had to do the bare minimum that was listed in their job description. And if they just did that, took an hour out of their time to check on him at the house after he was placed there, he would still be alive today. And I truly believe that. But they didn't even do that. They weren't just lazy. They did absolutely nothing. They were negligent. They did not do their jobs. As far as I've been able to see, DCS has not publicly commented on this case, and why would they? They know that they are directly responsible for the death of Judah. They know that they didn't do their jobs. They know that the blood of this four-year-old child is on their hands. Either way, as of right now, Gina has filed for a civil lawsuit against Alan for the death of his child. They blame CPS for their inaction. Obviously, they blame Alan for being a monster. But most of all, with the civil lawsuit, Gina just wants an explanation. Why did he treat this sweet, adorable young boy so badly? What is so wrong inside of him that made him think that this was okay? What is so wrong with him that made him look at this four-year-old little child probably begging to be treated just normally and still decide that he doesn't deserve that? People want answers. We all want answers. At a sentencing hearing, Alan denied giving a statement of remorse two times. I saw one statement from a judge which said that he blamed it on being a blur and he tried blaming the abuse that he handed down on that baby on everybody else but himself. He will not take accountability for what he did, which makes me just that much more angry with this case that even the person responsible won't hold himself accountable for what he did. Something good that did come out of this case was Judah's Law, which was passed in early 2022. This law allows unlicensed caregivers the chance to stop a child from being placed with their biological parents if they pose a threat to the child's safety. Because according to Gina, they wouldn't listen to her or really even take her words seriously when she warned the courts of the glaring red flags that were there. So I hope this new law does make a difference I hope that some children can be saved. I hope that when these adults do express their concerns, that they're actually listened to. I hope CPS does some internal review to figure out how this happened, and I hope that they will eventually come out to the public to tell us why and how this happened, but I, I'm not holding my breath. I don't think that's going to happen with CPS. They dropped the ball. They know they dropped the ball. And frankly, they're not taking accountability for it. Nobody's taking accountability for this young child's death. And it's, that's one of the most infuriating things about this case is the lack of accountability by all people involved. But for now, that is all of the information that I have on this case. Again, as I was researching, I had to stop multiple times to assess whether I even could cover this case. I could not believe what this child went through. I can't imagine that there are people out there that are so evil that they will go to these levels to abuse a child. And the biggest question that I have is if they didn't want him. They clearly didn't. They clearly did not want this little boy in their home. If they didn't want him so badly, why not just let him stay with a family who will love him? I will never understand. Why do these parents want their children back if they are such an inconvenience to them? Clearly, these parents did not love Judah. They clearly did not want him around. They left him in that basement, didn't even treat him like a human being. They left him for days and hours at a time. They clearly wanted nothing to do with him. They clearly did not want to raise him. They clearly did not see him as a human. So why do they want him in their home? Why didn't they just let Gina keep him? I will never, never understand. Because if they had just left their shitty ass parenting out of this, left their children out of it, they wouldn't be in jail right now. Maybe these parents need to think about that next time. If you want a little person in your house that you don't freaking like, just let them go back to their foster parents. I, I will never understand. I will never understand how this happened, why it happened. It's so frustrating. It's so infuriating, but that is where I am going to leave this case. You all know that I can rant on and on about everything wrong in this case and the system. 
but I can at least be hopeful that maybe there will be some movement. Hopefully, Mary will have to take responsibility for what she did. Again, I will let you all know what happens with that. There has been a new law passed, and I really hope that this new law makes a big difference, and I really hope it saves the lives of at least one child. I guess that's the one good thing that came out of this case. But now I want to know what you all think about this awful, awful, awful tragedy of a case. How do you think CPS let this happen? Do you think it was pure laziness or do you think there's something else to explain this? Do you think that they'll ever come out and explain how this happened? Do you think that Mary will take accountability for what she did or do you think Alan will ever come out to say that he feels bad? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and now I have a TikTok page. All will be listed down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form that is listed down below as well. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.